Hello, welcome back to Science Terminology. Uh, we're going to talk about earthquakes today, um, and that's when the planet moves and shakes. And we're going to talk about what causes earthquakes, um, where they occur most often, and just a few other facts about them. So let's start off with the main question, what are earthquakes? Uh, and earthquakes are when the tectonic plates underneath us move suddenly. Um, tectonic plates move all the time. Um, but earthquakes happen when these plates slide past each other very quickly. Um, so they're always kind of moving a little bit. But when they, when they like really slide, that's when we start to have earthquakes. Um, and earthquakes can be kind of a scary experience, right? The ground shaking, um, the building that you're in is shaking, all that kind of stuff is terrifying. Um, but um, there's a lot of things that we've learned to um, help mitigate the damage of earthquakes in the last couple decades. So we're getting a lot better at that. So what causes these earthquakes? I already kind of mentioned it, but they're really caused by plate movement. Um, and the places that plates move most often are at the boundaries between plates. And here I've got a picture of the three different types of plate boundaries. We've got um, a divergent plate boundary here in the center, a convergent plate boundary over here, and then we have a transform boundary out here in the ocean. Uh, convergent boundaries, that's when two plates are coming together. Divergent boundaries are when they're splitting apart. And then transform boundaries are when they are going opposite directions. So like that. Okay. Um, and the, there are the three, those are the three types. And that's, of course, where earthquakes are going to be happening because that's where the plates are moving the most. Um, so here's kind of a uh, more in-depth uh, understanding of, of what's up with tecton uh, the tectonic movements. Um, convergent plate boundaries um, happen where there's a lot of mountains, because generally when there's a convergent plate boundary, um, a one of the plates gets pushed underneath the other one, and it pushes that plate up. So you end up with mountain ranges and volcanoes and stuff in that area. So you could think of like uh, the Andes Mountains in South America or um, Japan is actually a convergent plate boundary. Uh, divergent plate boundaries, that's where two plates go get pushed away from each other. Um, and these plates slide away and that creates a lot of volcanic activity, which can be accompanied by earthquakes. Um, and the biggest divergent plate boundary on Earth is in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and then the transform plate boundaries are where they slide against each other, like I said. Um, and the most common or the most famous one, I guess, in the United States is the San Andreas Fault in California. So those are all different kind of plate boundaries. Um, and so here on the map is a kind of a, an image of where all the plate boundaries are in the world. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and these are where they happen most often. As you can see, there are certain lines where this is where the most kind of activity is. These red dots are considered hot spots. These are spots where there is higher volcanic activity than normal. For instance, Hawaii is one of those instances, Iceland, right? Um, so there's also a lot of uh, tectonic activity there, a lot of earthquakes as well. Um, I currently live in Wisconsin, which is over here. So as you can see, not really a plate boundary there. But for my friends who live in California or South America, um, that's where put, there is a plate boundary there. So that kind of stuff can happen there. Now, the Ring of Fire is the area of the world with the most volcanic and earthquake activity in the world. And it is a kind of a circle that goes from the bottom of South America all the way up and around through to Oceania. Um, and we have this elaborate detect detection system that we've put in place to try to predict and prepare for these eruptions and tremors, um, especially because there's a lot of ocean in this area and uh, it causes tsunamis and um, other issues other than the earthquake itself. So there's a lot of, there's been a lot of scientific work uh, being put into understanding how the ring of fire works um, and making an effort to predict how, when it, when things will happen so that we can prepare for it better. Here's some historical earthquakes of major proportions, because I feel like you can't really talk about earthquakes and cool stuff like that without talking about some big ones. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is the Cusco earthquake of 1650. Um, this earthquake resulted in the deaths of about 5,000 people. 
Uh, and the earthquake lasted at least 15 minutes. Um, and we don't know exactly the long, amount of time because it was so long ago, um, but it caused considerable damage to the city and it, it caused mudslides and building collapses and all the groundwater ended up being disturbed and kind of gross afterwards. The only reason we really know about this is because um, Spain had already conquered this area. And so it's in the Spanish record and that's how we know about it. Uh, the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 leveled the city at like five in the morning. Um, and it can be felt all throughout California. 3000 people died and 80% of the city was destroyed. So they had to basically rebuild all of San Francisco in 1907 uh, because in 1906, it all got knocked over in this earthquake. That's that San Andreas fault that I told you about earlier. Uh, in 2010, a more recent earthquake happened in Haiti. Um, it was extremely damaging because there were 52 aftershocks that happened after the initial quake. Earthquakes sometimes have what are called aftershocks, and that's when the ground continues to tremor after the original earthquake happens. Um, sometimes they can be one aftershock, sometimes it can be 52 aftershocks, right? So it depends on the tectonic activity happening in the region. Um, anywhere from 100,000 to 160,000 people died during these earthquakes. That number could be even higher. Um, Haiti does not have the greatest record system, um, nor the greatest government. So these numbers are not 100% accepted. Um, and the death toll was um, higher than other natural disasters due to the state of poverty that Haiti is in to begin with. In more developed nations with stronger economies, um, that live on fault lines like this and in areas where earthquakes happen, they have infrastructure that's resistant to these sorts of things to make it so that less people get hurt. Um, Haiti does not have that. So they, uh, most of their buildings were shambled because of it. As you can see in this picture behind us, our words here. The last one we'll talk about is the uh, Japanese earthquake in 2011. It was off the coast of Japan. This is part of the ring of fire that I was talking about earlier and it caused this huge tsunami and it was the fourth largest earthquake that it was ever recorded this earthquake caused a meltdown at the fukushima nuclear power plant you remember when that happened um, there was a big deal because it was leaking nuclear waste down to the ocean um, and the damage was catastrophic and they're still kind of starting they're still cleaning up parts of it um, there's radioactive um, fallout in that area because of that um, a nice little bright spot though um, unfortunate, but kind of bright, um, is that the elderly Japanese volunteered to clean up at the power plant so that young people wouldn't get hurt by the radiation. These are like 80 and 90 year old people who are like, hey, I've lived a long life. I'll clean this mess up uh, because I don't want young people to be affected by it, which is pretty nice. It's sad they had to do that, but it's it's also kind of a nice little feel good, feel good moment in our hearts there. Let's talk about one other type of earthquake, which is becoming more popular, and not popular, popular is the wrong word, more frequent in the last decade or two, and it's fracking earthquakes. If you don't know what fracking is, fracking is a uh, well stimulation technique where you shoot pressurized liquid into a gas well. Basically, it's kind of a way to loosen up um, hydrocarbons that we're digging for um, and old wells that may not be pumping gas anymore. And this process creates cracks in the bedrock and allows gas and petroleum to flow more freely so that you can get it out of the, the, the well. Um, how does fracking cause earthquake though? Well, fracking also, like I said, loosens bedrock. And so it's weakening the structure of the land and the fracturing of the surface has kind of caused this increased seismic activity in an area where earthquakes are not as common. If you remember all the way back to that map I showed you, there is no plate boundary in Central America, yet we're getting ginormous magnitude earthquakes in New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, um, where we wouldn't have normally gotten them if this fracking hadn't been happening, which is kind of an issue, right? Is it worth taking all these hydrocarbons out, which are polluting our atmosphere, um, and also potentially destroying our lands through earthquakes? So the other thing that's bad about fracking is it also has been shown to contaminate drinking water um, because of the loose bedrock. And then also, of course, petroleum products are being, you know, escaping into the water table, which is great. Um, so fixing water sources from fracking has become a major health concern in the southern United States where fracking is mostly done. 
um, in wells, like in Texas and Oklahoma and, and Arkansas, I guess, um, down there is where this is happening. Um, and it's, it's making it harder for an already poverty stricken region. Thank you so much for watching. Um, and, uh, please subscribe and we'll see you later.